My name is Charles Swanson. Today is September 11, 2015, and I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee to interview Sidney Gilreath. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Please tell us your full name and the date of your birth. Sidney Gilreath, August 22nd, 1936. Tell us a little bit about your maternal grandparents, please, sir. My maternal grandparents, uh, my grandfather was Bracken Gilreath. Bracken, did Bracken. you say? B-R-A-C-K-E-N? Yeah, they called him Brack. I think his people came from South Carolina. Uh, he and his... Uh, wife uh, on, had a farm in Kodak and uh, I only knew him when I was very small. I, didn't, I don't remember much about him. And what was your grandmother's name? My grandmother's name was uh, Ophelia Underwood Gilreath. Now Bracken and Ophelia lived in Kodak. Tell us exactly where you find Kodak around here. Well, there's a road that starts in East Knox, Knoxville near John Sevier Highway called Kodak Road. And it goes through a little community called Tuckahoe. Well, first it goes through Riverdale, then Tuckahoe, then Kodak. So Kodak is right on the border between Sevier County, Jefferson County, and Knox County. Mm -hmm. It's near Douglas Dam. Tell us, please, about your paternal grandparents. My paternal grandparents. My maternal grandparents. Your maternal grandparents. I think you just told us about your paternal, paternal grandparents. Right. All right. Maternal grandparents uh, was, uh, their name was Shepherd. My mother was a shepherd. And uh, so we had uh, Elihu Shepherd. And uh, uh, Tina, I believe it was her name, uh, they lived in Kodak also. Do you know what business that your grandfather, uh, Mr. Shepard, was engaged in? Farming. Farming. Tell us about your parents. Why don't you start with your mother and tell us a little bit about your mother first. My mother, uh, her name was Belle, B-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, <coughs> McCamig. Shepherd Gilreath. She was a, she was she was a school teacher. She taught in a one room school, and she had a little bit, some college uh, education, but not very much. But back then, the school teachers all didn't have to have college degrees. And there there used to be a little college in Sevierville called Murphy Murphy College, and it was a one building I think school also. But she was a school teacher. Uh, and then when she married my father, she came, became a housewife. Was there a rule against a, a <clears throat> teacher being married? Do you know that? I don't know. I, I've heard that, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. And your, grand, uh, your father's <clears throat> name was? Sidney Earl Gilreath. So you're not a junior. He had a different middle name. Different than middle name, right. right. And what did your father do? He did uh, several different jobs. He was a farmer, a mail carrier, electrician, all of the above. Uh, so his mail route would only take half a day. Kodak had two mail routes, one and two. And so his mail route took him to, into Knox County. He was, he was route number one and he began carrying the mail in the 20s. And what did he do when his mail, mail route was finished? Okay, okay he worked that. on the farm, which was the farm that my grandfather owned. Because when I was growing up, my grandfather had already, was already deceased. So my father had that farm, and we worked on that farm. And what crops were they farming? <clears throat> we had uh, corn, wheat, uh, tobacco and dairy cows. 
uh, at one later on we got electric milkers. So we were we were selling milk to the pet milk company. So it was a pretty large farm for that area. Yeah, about 200 acres. Were you located in the Sevier County part of of Kodak? Barely. Just barely. barely. All right. A lot a lot I remember a lot of my friends, some of them went to Knox County Schools and some of them went to Sevier County School. Some of them went to Carter High School. Some of them went to Sevier High School. Were your parents involved in your educational process in any way? You know, my parents, my daddy was not a college graduate, but he really believed in education. And uh, <clears throat> he wanted his children to get a good education. Uh, I remember when we were doing electrical work, we, we wired a lot of houses in that area when they first put the electricity in the Kodak. And so we would, uh, we would wire houses for people back in the 50s when I was growing up, 12, 13, 14 years old. So I learned that, like that trade. And then later on I became assistant mail carrier, but but he believed in education, and he wanted us all to go to college. So uh, most of my brother and sister did have some college. So how many brothers and sisters did you have? Three brothers, no. One, two, uh, two brothers and three sisters. Can you do names and birth order for me? Well, my, my oldest brother was Francis Carlisle. And then my next to him was Christine. Then there was 10 years between those two and the next group, which included me and my brother Wayne, and he was a twin, and me. Then my sister Catherine, who became a doctor. Then my younger brother Gordon, who became a school teacher. Was your family involved in politics in any way over in Sevier County? My daddy w was interested in politics. He was he was on the school board, but he was always a, he was a Democrat. He was a Democrat in a Republican county, but he was a, he was a uh, a Roosevelt Democrat and a Harry Truman Democrat. So I grew up listening to him talk about how the Democrat Party was for the little people. Do you think that growing up in the Kodak area played a particular role in the person that you were to become later in life? I do. In what way? In what way? When I was, uh, when I was a substitute mail carrier, I had learned to deal with the public. And I learned to what they call manage expectations, which is part of our job. And every, every job is, has that problem. But I remember one time uh, on my mail route, this young girl came out to the mailbox. She says, when are you going to bring me a letter from my boyfriend? I said, when he writes it. <laughs> that was my answer. <laughs> but I had to deal with people, you know, and, and as a mail carrier. I, they bought stamps, you know, and they, they expected their Christmas presents to be delivered on time. And, and they also expected their Social Security checks to be delivered on time. <laughs> So, other than managing expectations of, of the folks who were de delivered mail, any other particular role you think that, that growing up in Kodak made in your character or who you are now? I do because my daddy expected us to work. We had to get up and work at something. He wanted us to do something. And, and, but he wanted us to also to work toward getting an education. So uh, those things he, d he drilled in our, in our souls all the time. And, and he, he, kept, he would always show us the benefits of, of hard work and an education. And I always remembered that. So where did you go to high school? Went to Sevier County High School. Were you engaged in any type of sports or activities while you were in high school? Yeah, before, when I was growing up, uh, baseball was very popular because 
it was right after World War II had, had completed and a lot of the soldiers were coming back from the war and, and there were a lot of baseball teams that, that grew up in areas because there was, that was the thing to do in, on weekends. You know, Saturday was the thing for baseball. So I, I wanted to be a baseball player. And uh, so I started playing baseball and watching baseball. How old were you baseball. when you started playing baseball? Uh, in an organized probably, way? Uh, in an organized way, it was probably 12, 13. And so uh, I played baseball in high school. And, uh, and while I was in high school, I played in the summertime, I played baseball in the Babe Ruth League, which is one step above Little League. Right. Uh, it was uh, four, 13, four, uh, 14, 15, uh, maybe up to 16 years old. And so we, we had a team. I played with Dandridge, Tennessee. What position did you play? Second base. <clears throat> so at the end of the season, at the end of the baseball season that year, <clears throat> they took the best players from Dandridge and Jefferson City and Newport and Marstown and Greenville and formed one team for, called the East Tennessee team. And we played in the original uh, championships in order to get to the World Series. So we won the original championships, so we got to go to the Babe Ruth League World Series in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Now, the, the championships, were they for Tennessee teams or a larger region than that? Tennessee teams. Uh, so, I remember we rode the train from Marstown, Tennessee to Asbury Park, New Jersey, which was quite a thrill for somebody, you know, 13, 14 years old. Uh, and uh, we played Boystown, Nebraska. They were bigger than we were. For some reason, their 16-year-olds were bigger than our 16-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> and they, the first, the first batter up knocked the ball not only over the fence, but over the, over the bleachers in the outfield. It was an inauspicious start. Yeah. <laughs> How'd it go from there? We, we lost. <laughs> but I got to go to see a Major League Baseball a game at that time. They took us over to Philadelphia from Asbury Park, New Jersey to watch a Major League Baseball game. That's the first time I'd ever seen a Major League Baseball game. Was it Connie Mack Park in Philadelphia yep. at that point? Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? That was great. I mean, I couldn't believe it because I'd only seen, see, we didn't have, I didn't have television until we were a little bit later. So I didn't get to watch baseball except I read about it in, in books and magazines. So I knew who all the baseball players were on every team, what their number was, and everything. And uh, because I felt like that I, I might be good enough to play professional baseball. And so I played high school baseball and did very well at it in high school. So was your, uh, was your team a successful team when you were in high school? Yeah, we did good, yeah. Yeah. Did you engage in any other activities in high school other than your your baseball career? Well, I was in the school plays. I was president of my class, my senior class. Uh, I was in the what they call the Beta Club then, which is an academic club. And uh, I was pretty popular. My, my high school, if you look in the annual of 54, that was my high school year. Under, my, under, the, your, under your picture, they always put a little phrase. Right. And in mine, they put, our Pepe Kleist president gets along with everyone except, especially the girls. <laughs> <laughs> How big was your class? 125. So Kodak, where you live, was just right in the edge of Sevier County, if I'm not mistaken. Is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. How far was it from your home in Kodak to Sevier County High School? How far did you have to travel? 
It was about 15 miles, maybe 20. I talked to somebody about uh, your trip to Sevier County High School on a daily basis from Kodak, and they said to ask you if you remembered O Shaky. Do you remember something called O Shaky? I sure do. Tell me about that. We rode the school bus. The school bus came right by my house. And so the school bus would, would travel from uh, Kodak up toward Douglas Lake, Douglas Dam, which was partly in Sevier County, partly in Jefferson County. And then we'd go across this bridge, which was right below Douglas Dam, called Old Shaky, very narrow bridge. And then go around the Catlitz, Catlitzburg, and uh, then uh, into Sevierville, which would take, what, 45 minutes, an hour, from the time you stopped and picked up a lot of people. And so were you riding a school bus that distance? Yeah, every day. Tell us now about your decision to go to college. Is that you told us that your parents were interested in education. Is right. that something that was just expected of you? Or? It was expected, and my oldest sister, Christine, had gone to Maryville College and graduated in, in uh, 48. And I remember going over there to see her a few times when she was in college, and I, I, liked, I liked the uh, campus. But we, my parents took me to other colleges to, to look at. We went to LMU, to Emory and Henry, Carson Newman, Maryville, Tennessee Tech, uh, probably, and went to several colleges. And <clears throat> I decided for, to go to Maryville for two reasons. Number one, my sister went there. Number two, they had a baseball coach named Lomney Honecker, who I thought would help me obtain something in my professional career as a baseball player. So I went over there and I went about for baseball and I played baseball there. And were you successful in your baseball career in, at Maryville? I was, well, not as successful as I was in high school because the competition was a little better. But I was able to, to make the team play second base. Did you consider baseball as a profession after college? Well, I learned while I was playing baseball in college, I learned one thing. There's one thing that a professional baseball player has to have. And you can't learn it. Nobody can teach it to you. Uh, you can't develop it. Either you got it or you don't. And that's a good arm. If you don't have it, then you're not going to be a professional baseball player. And I learned that at Maryville College, that I was not going to be a professional baseball player. Are you still a baseball fan? Oh, yeah. I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. It's been a frustrating few decades for you, hasn't it? It sure has. <laughs> but I had a, had a real good friend, a, a lawyer in Chicago, and I used to go up there and he would take me to the Cubs games. So did you go directly then from Maryville College then to law school? Yeah, while I was at Maryville College, uh, I had classes in the morning and I had free time in the afternoon. So the, the college was close to the Blount County Courthouse. So I would walk down to the courthouse and watch, watch trials. For entertainment? Yeah. And uh, I remember Judge Oliver was the judge. And, D.K. Thomas was one of the lawyers, Kelly Thomas's father, and, and I knew those, I met those lawyers, and I'd watch them, you know, do their trials, and I thought, well, this is interesting. Uh, so that's kind of got, got me interested in law school. So I knew by the time I got to be a senior in college that, there's, that, that, that I wanted to do something that, uh, uh, I could deal with people because I didn't I didn't like science and, and engineering and things like that. I like dealing with people, like social social studies and so forth. And uh, I wanted to go into a profession. I wasn't smart enough to go to the medical profession, 
well, I had a lot of pre-med students in school with me, but I, I, well, I didn't feel like I was smart enough to be a doctor. So I decided, well, I'll go to law school. So right out of college, I, I, went, to, I went to UT. And Tell us about the admission process at UT <coughs> at that time. Is it pretty much the same as it is now, or is it different then? I remember going over there, and and and, uh, and they they were all I had to do was take the LSAT and apply. That's it. And the LSAT score didn't get you in, or it didn't keep you in, or now, get the you LSAT in or keep you was out. the law school admissions test, right? Right. Uh, it, uh, back then, I don't know how it was graded. Now but it's graded four. I made four thirty on it. I remember my grade, which was not very good because I didn't study for it. And um, but I, w I was able to get in, so here I was going from a small school like Maryville College, where you couldn't have a car on campus. Uh, there was curfew. There was a very strict environment. Uh, here I was going to a big university, and just turn loose, and, and on a big campus. And it was, it was almost like going to college again. Were you scared or were you having fun? I was having fun, <laughs> finally. <laughs> so I started law school and uh, I flunked a course because I was partying too much and not, not being exercising enough discipline. And I got put on probation. And Did they, that surprise you? Uh, yeah, first time I'd ever flunked a course in my life, and it scared me too, because I was afraid I was going to get, not get back in. And uh, I remember going before the committee uh, to ask to be readmitted. Do you remember who was on that committee? I remember Dr. Overton was on it, and I believe Colonel Warner. And maybe um, Dean Wicker. I'm not sure. There was three people. But uh, so I, what I did, I, I agreed to take the course over. I stayed out a quarter and took the same course over in the spring. And uh, and then back then, when you take a course over, it replaced the first grade. So. I studied hard that summer. I, I didn't go to summer school. I studied to get that course back under my belt. So uh, I took the course over, and I said, "If you all just let me back in, I will. I will do good. I will study hard. You won't. You won't be disappointed if you let me back in." So they agreed to let me back in. So your first successful case was in your first year of law school. Yeah, when you won your own case. Right. So how did the rest of your law law school career go? I studied hard. I really I had to study hard because I wasn't smart enough to uh, just read a case one time and get it. Uh, some of the, we had people in our law school class, and back back then I don't know how it is now, but your grade, your final grade was your was your grade. That's all. That's the only grade you had. What you did on the final grade, and so. But I couldn't, I couldn't wait and then study at the last minute and, and do it. I had to, I had to brief those cases uh, every day, whether I was called on or not. And I had to read them two or three times sometimes to get the issue. But I remember one rule that Dr. Overton taught me. He says, ask yourself, what is, why is this case in this book, at, at this place in the book? If you'll figure that out, then you'll figure out what the important issue is. Because they put it there for a reason. So anyway, I, I studied hard and, and took uh, some extra time to get through law school. It, I, it took me more than three years to get through because of my delay and, and I wanted to do good. And, and so uh, I graduated in 63. And do you think in the long run, <clears throat> taking that extra time and going through it in the way you did was more valuable to you for your entire career than if you'd have done it otherwise? I really do.
because I was motivated. I was after they agreed to let me in. I didn't want to disappoint it. I didn't want to disappoint my parents either. Matter of fact, I didn't tell them that I'd flunked the course. I didn't tell them that I stayed out a quarter. I just so I, you weren't living at home. I, I wasn't it. living at home, so I just I just went over on the hill and took some courses that quarter, psychology course or something. They didn't know that they didn't never know I'd flunked flunked a course and I'd stayed out a quarter. <laughs> Did you ever tell them later on? No, I didn't. I was sad. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1963, by the time you got out of law school, yeah, I got out in 62. 62? All right. The United States was involved in, in the war in Vietnam, weren't they? Yes. And at any point, did you engage in any type of military service? Well, I had a commitment. I'd, I'd been getting deferments. So as soon as I got out of law school, my deferments were up. And so I joined the National Guard and uh, Army National Guard because by defer I was going to get drafted if I hadn't and so but uh, then I made a commitment to be in the National Guard and then went off to um, boot camp in Fort Jackson, South, South Carolina. It was kind of lucky because when I, when I got to Fort Jackson there was a guy over there that I was in law school with named John Nolan, and uh, he, he'd already been there. He got out a little bit before I did because I was slow getting out. He, he got out and he was already over there. He knew the ropes, so he kind of showed me the ropes at Fort Jackson. And uh, we, we then, after uh, basic training, uh, he, he helped me get assigned to the JAG office. So I was in the JAG office then after that. Was your entire career in the in the National Guard with the JAG office then after your basic training? Yeah. And how many years did you spend in the National Guard? Well, I spent, uh, it's one of those deals where you had to go to summer camp after you got back out. And it was about six or eight years, but it was you know, part time. You talked just a minute ago about you had a commitment and you ran out of deferments. The young lawyers of today who may be listening to this interview, they don't know about uh, a mandatory commitment and deferments. Tell us how that actually worked at that time. Well, when you become 18 at that time, you had to register for the draft. So they had the draft, the draft was the law. All, all males, 18, had to register for the draft, and if they needed you, they called you up. And they were eventually going to get to you anyway. So there, there were certain things you could do to def defer your having to go into, into the, the military. Such as? Going to school and going to college. So that, that you would get uh, deferments while you were in college as long as you were passing and keeping, staying in school. And then after you got out, though, then your deferments were, you had no more deferments, so you had to satisfy your obligation some way. So let's go back now to your, to your legal career. After you got out of law school, what's the next thing that happened in your legal career? Where, how did you find a job? Okay, after I got out of the Army. That's, sorry. After law school. Yes. I came back to Knoxville. And I went around to all the firms looking for a job. You know, Edgerton McAfee, Francis McCollum, Seymour, um, you know, all the big firms, Arnett Draper, Stone and Hines. And none of them would hire me. Number one, I wasn't an A student. I don't even know if I was a B student. I might have been between a B and a C, but I wasn't a, a B student. And so um, I knew this lawyer named Hugh Tapp, who had a, he, he had a solo practice, but he had a great library. He was in the Burwell building. He represented a lot of estates in town, and uh, like C.B. Atkins and a lot of companies. And he knew my father, 
So I started, I, would, I started going to him to try to get advice on what to do. And one thing he, he said that I'll never forget, he said, you've you got to make your breaks in this town. And that always stuck with me. And that meant you got to get in there, be known, work in the bar, and just make your breaks. And then something good will happen. So I couldn't get a job, so I kept going back to him and getting advice. Was there a placement office at the university to assist young lawyers? Not that I know of. I don't think so. Okay. I know Colonel Warner used to help people get placed, but they were usually good students. And they wanted, you know, A students, the, right. the firms did, in Kingsport or Knoxville or somewhere. So one day I kept going back to him and pestering him. Mr. Tapp, you're yeah. referring to now. He said, well, I've got a library in here with a big table like this table. I said, why don't you just set up in here? You won't be a partner or mine or anything. You'll just be on your own. You won't have to pay any rent. You set up your own office and, uh, and start practicing on your own. So, you know, I said, well, okay. Uh, so I set up at the end of his table had a phone, had my own stationery, 500 Burwell building, and uh, his, his receptionist answered the phone for me. And so that's how I started, just general, general practice. I did divorces, uh, personal injury, anything in Sessions Court. He didn't do any of that. He, he was just this corporate lawyer. And so he would feed me cases. Uh, that he did not want to handle. And uh, so that's how I started. So I had sent, I sent all the people on my mail route an announcement that I'd opened in my law practice and here's my address. <laughs> and so I started getting business, you know, and uh, took, it, uh, took it seriously. Uh, and, you know, I remember I'd go to one bank and borrow five hundred dollars to cover in a bank loan in another bank, you know, and just uh, operating like that. And how long did you practice from Mr. Tapp's conference room? A couple of years. It was a very generous offer on his part. It was, it yes. Did you have in mind as you were going into the law? Did you have in mind a particular type of law that you wanted to practice, if you could? Not at first, no. But it kind of it kind of worked into it because, um, in, in doing general practice, then you naturally will gravitate toward uh, helping people, and and I wasn't representing any, any companies, so I was just helping people, and so that naturally involved uh, divorces and personal injury practice, and and so I I, I kind of liked the personal injury practice because that was uh, seemed to be the more success more uh, better earnings if I, if he could do it. So I started going to seminars to learn how to do it. And I started going to seminars before I even had the cases to learn how to do those kind of cases. And, uh, and then I started to uh, be active in the bar, uh, the Bar Association. The Knoxville Bar Association or other bars? The Knoxville Bar Association. I remember uh, having these lun those luncheons, you know, and I would help set them up. And I, I remember we used to meet in the, in the SW cafeteria. Uh, Over there upstairs. on Gay Street. Yeah, upstairs. Right. So do you remember the first case you ever tried? Yes. Tell me about that one. It was a personal injury case of an old elderly lady who got rear-ended. And uh, the people that caused the wreck were from Florida, so it was fi I filed it in federal court. I don't know why I filed it in federal court, but I did. And I worked hard on that case. 
they didn't want to settle, my clients didn't want to settle, so I had to try it. <laughs> I got into a situation where I had to try it. And I didn't want to go over there unprepared. So I used to go over there and watch Judge Taylor operate before I ever went into court with this case and watch some people try cases. And uh, some good lawyers like Jack Dowdy and other lawyers. And uh, uh, so the case came up for trial and we had to go to trial. How Didn't did have it go? any choice. <laughs> and we were offered $7,500 and the jury gave us $7,500, same, same as we were offered. You know, it seems like everybody in this town who ever practiced in Judge Robert Taylor's court has a number of Judge Taylor stories. Do you have any favorite Judge Taylor stories from your practice? One time later on in the 80s, that, that Bob Pryor used to practice with me and we were trying a case in his court, and uh, Philip Duran was on the other side. And Bob Pryor was up making the opening of the final argument, and I was going to make the second argument. And as he was giving his argument, I was leaning back in my chair on those, case, on those chairs over there that had rollers on them, and my chair went out from under me. Now, I ended up in the floor. With your feet sticking straight up? Straight up. And Joe Farmer was the U.S. Mar uh, Marshal then. He came running over to pick me up, or pick the chair up mainly. <laughs> and I was turning red, red, red. I didn't know what to say, if I say, should say anything. I didn't say anything, because I didn't know what to say. Did Judge Taylor say anything? Judge Taylor just looked down over his glasses and didn't say a word, which was worse than if he'd said something. If he'd said something, I could have responded. He didn't say a word. Did the jury laugh at The you? jury laughed. But they kept trying to hold it down because everybody was afraid of Judge Taylor. <laughs> so I got back up and uh, it, it was really embarrassing. But And were you able to then to do the closing closing? Yeah. I did it. And did you mention your fall when you uh, No, I didn't. I didn't know whether to say anything or not. And so you elected not to? I elected not to. How'd the case come out? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> so after you started your law practice, how long was it before you, before you felt like, you know, hey, I'm going to be able to make a living out of this? Ten years. Wow. Then I felt comfortable. Ten years. Uh, you know, I, it took me a long time to conquer my fear, which is what you have when you're when you're uh, young and inexperienced. It's a lot of fear. Fear of what? Well, just fear of going before a jury and saying the wrong thing, messing up, failure, fear of failure. Fear of disappointing your client, uh, fear of not uh, doing a professional job, it's just, it's mostly self-induced fear. But uh, it took me a long time to uh, to get over that. How'd you get over it? Keep Just keep doing it. That's the only way, just keep doing it. I know that you have now devoted the, the majority of your practice to the plaintiff's personal injury work of various types. At what point in your career did you decide you were going to go in that in that route? I would say uh, two or three years after I started practicing. I used and what to go, was it that made you want to do that? Well, I felt like that was the only, uh, or that was the, uh, I felt like that that was something that I could be successful at. Uh, and uh, I, I watched some good lawyers do cases, and I felt like, well, I can do that if they can do that. 
Can you remember uh, the names of those good lawyers you watched try cases? Can sure. you tell us a few I mean, of those? Well, it was not only uh, good lawyers in trying cases, but also in going to seminars. But uh, Jack Dowdy was one of the best lawyers I ever saw try a case. Uh, McAfee Lee, uh, Joe Henry, uh, and uh, and then also I watched lawyers make mistakes. And I would go if I had free time. I would go to the, by the courthouse to see if somebody was trying a case. And I watched uh, a lot of lawyers. Uh, make good decisions and make bad decisions. And then I, when I would go to seminars, I started uh, meeting great lawyers from New York and Chicago and places. And so I started keeping a lot of notes on, on uh, things that would be helpful. Did you find the older law lawyers to be generous with you in terms of their advice and, and trying to help you become a better lawyer, or did you just have to do it by just watching? Uh, some, some did, and s s most did. Most would be generous. Um, <clears throat> but the, the main way to, to learn it is to do it. We did a lot of trials back then. Whereas we don't do so many now because of mediation, but back then we would go to trial, and, and this. And when I started, we didn't have discovery either. We didn't have the rules of discovery. So, so would that make for more exciting cases? Make more interesting cases because you would have witnesses that they didn't even know about, and they would have witnesses that you didn't know about, unless you did a good job of investigating the case. So. Uh, so it was both. How did not having the rules of discovery impact your your ability to try a case? It made you have to work harder to get the case prepared. You had to go out and do your own. You had to get out of your office, and you didn't have interrogatories and depositions. So you had to get out of your office and go find the witnesses, go find, go talk to the doctors and, and prepare your case yourself. You, it's not anything you can get somebody else to do, really. Do you recall any particularly interesting or unusual cases that you tried? Yeah. Uh, one was the case of Sterling versus Velsicol, which was in Memphis, Tennessee, where the uh, Velsicol Chemical Company, which made pesticides, polluted an uh, uh, underground water supply in a little town called Toon, Tennessee. Say that again? Toon, Tennessee. It's in, in near Bolivar, Tennessee. And these people all used wells for their water supply. This, this community did. And they all got sick. They all got injury. They all got, uh, some got cancer. Some of them got uh, other diseases from these chemicals that this chemical company had. What happened was, they also called it, bought a farm in, near Toon and dug a big, big trench. And their byproducts from their pesticide manufacturer, they would haul out there and dump it in this, this landfill. It had no, uh, no uh, support underneath it. So it, it leached into the underground water supply. So these people got injured and we tried that case for six months in Memphis and I got a verdict and then it was appealed to the Sixth Circuit 
and uh, then we settled it, but it was quite an experience. So a case you try for six months over in Memphis, you just move your residence essentially to Memphis to, to try the case? I had a, well we had a, we had a, there was a small hotel, a motel right there near the federal building that we, we rented rooms. I left my clothes, I had an airplane then so I was flying. And I would fly over there on Sunday night and then Friday afternoon, I would fly back to Knoxville and go back on Sunday. And so I'd leave my clothes over there. And uh, uh, now the six months, it, was, it took six months because we didn't do it five days a week. Judge Odell Horton was trying the case and he would have to take recesses. So sometimes we'd have three or four days off before we'd go back. So uh, it, it was, uh, I didn't make much money on the case. By the time, by the time I got in that case, until we got paid, was 10 years. And but because of the appeals and everything. If I figured up my hourly rate, it would not be very much. Because we were on a contingent fee. So that was quite an experience. Do you think that uh, trying that case made a difference in the way companies handle disposing of, of hazardous type wastes? I do, I do. In what way? They're more safety conscious because they had to pay a lot of money out, of, I think $12 million. Uh, and and they, had, they tried to put a cap on that, on that dump site but that wasn't good enough, but, but. Uh, when you say they tried to put a cap on it, you mean that they tried to put dirt over top of the? Yeah, chemical? on top of the dump site, instead of on, under it, uh, which they, they thought it would keep it from leaching into the water supply, but it didn't work. So we had a lot of hydrologists testifying and, and doctors, and we had doctors from California and everywhere testifying in that case. They had a doctor from England uh, in that case. Jim Gentry, who defended the case from Chattanooga, uh, he, he, we got to be good friends in the case. I mean, he used to catch rides back with my airplane with me, ride back and forth with me <laughs> on it. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, then, then I got in involved in the Sinatra case when you say the Sinatra case, are you referring to a Sinatra we've heard of before? Yeah, Frank Sinatra. His, uh, I didn't represent him. I represented uh, the co-pilot of an airplane's widow. Frank Sinatra was in, was in Las Vegas at the time. And uh, his mother lived in Palm Springs, California. So he, he, ret he hired a company Learjet to fly his mother from Palm Springs to Las Vegas for his opening show. This was in the 70s. And uh, this Learjet had a pilot and a co-pilot, okay, two-man crew. So they picked Mrs. Sinatra up in Palm Springs and they took off northwest, and to get to Las Vegas, you had to make a right turn to go to Las Vegas. So the air traffic controller that they were talking to uh, had a fellow who was new, brand new. And of course, your your conversations with the pilot and the and the our traffic controllers is key, is very critical. So they took off and headed northwest, and as they were going out there, uh, Mr. Foley was the co-pilot, so I represented his widow in the case. As they were tooling out northwest, he gets on the, on the phone, he says, uh, they said, clear to 9,000. 
and he says, clear down, he, re, he re, always repeat the conversation. He said, clear down 9,000, he said, straight ahead right, and, and the air traffic controller said, right. He was headed right toward a mountain that was 9,400 feet high. So they were going to 9,000. They was, should have turned right, but they, they, were, they crashed into this mountain top, killed everybody. So Mrs. Foley's, Mr. Foley's widow, the pilot's widow, Frank Sinatra, sued the federal government under the, for the air traffic control negligence. So uh, his mother, Nat uh, Natalie Sinatra, had an $84,000 ring that was lost in the, they never found it. So he was suing for that and suing for her death. And then we were suing for the death of the co-pilot. And so we sued the federal government. For some reason, this airplane had been to Mexico on a trip before this, and the federal government was kind of interested in, in the flight service anyway. But uh, they, wanted to take, they wanted to take Frank Sinatra's deposition, so we all went to Las Vegas and to take his deposition. So the, uh, the uh, lady who was representing the federal government, her name was Cecile Hatfield. So she, she led off. So the first question she asked was, are you Mr. Sinatra, the entertainer? He says, there's only one. <laughs> so that's how it started out. But uh, what were your impressions of Frank Sinatra as a witness? Very direct, very direct. And you know, he'd been through this before, apparently. I mean, he'd, he'd been able, he'd, I guess he'd had depositions before. Uh, As I understand it, you wrote an article for the ABA Journal in which you referenced taking Mr. Sinatra's yeah. journal and the lessons that lawyers could learn from Mr. Sinatra. Do you recall that article? I do, but I don't remember exactly what I said. Uh, I, I've got the article. A, a lawyer from Chicago had that article uh, em embraced on a plaque and sent it to me. And I've still got it hanging in my office. Uh, but I remember something to the effect that he did it my way or something and, and uh, to be yourself. Uh, my recollection I, is that you talked about the, what young lawyers could learn from Frank Sinatra is sincerity and passion. I did. I remember that. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Do you think that's something young lawyers could still learn today from Frank Sinatra? That's key. Sincerity is key. Okay. Now you're you're telling us about this case, and you represent the the co-pilot's uh, widow, right? Right. How is it that Sid Gilreath in Knoxville, Tennessee, represents a co-pilot's wife? Who does she live here, or she was from happen? she was from Virginia. Her name was Paula Foley, and she was from Virginia. So how'd she get to Sid Gilreath? Through a, a lawyer, lawyer in Virginia, uh, Southwest Virginia. I used to do a lot of cases in Southwest Virginia, which is coal mining country. And uh, so she called a lawyer back home, and he, he knew that I was a pilot. And so I think that's the reason that uh, he referred her to me, because I was a pilot. And, and I was taking key depositions in the case of experts about using the checklist and, and, uh, and the air traffic control uh, communications. Uh, so I knew a little something about that, what needed to be done. Right. So I remember being in this office and looking through some books and seeing that Sid Gilreath has obtained a large number of multi-million dollar judgments over the course of his career. Out of those multi-million dollar judgments that you've obtained, 
other than the Velsicol case that you've already told us about. Which of those cases do you find to be the most memorable? One of them is Margaret Cruz. Margaret Cruz lived in Rutledge, Tennessee, and she, she was injured in a, in a minor accident. Uh, her, her, her brother was Dr. Hill, who was a doctor in, in Rutledge, and she was about 78 years old. She had a minor accident and she became a quadriplegic as a result of the accident. She was in a wheelchair. So we sued Ford Motor Company under product liability. And it was a defective airbag. The airbag was a delayed uh, implosion. It was delayed just a, a half a second. But what happened when it's delayed is she gets too close to it. It should catch her back before she gets too close. When she gets too close, then it comes out it drives her back, and it drove her back, and then her neck went forward, and she had arthritis in her neck at that age, and, and uh, she had a neck in, uh, injury from neck down. So she was a quadriplegic. So we tried the case in Rutledge, in the old courthouse. In the circuit court in Rutledge? Upstairs, yes. Mm -hmm. It's an upstairs courthouse. No elevator. Hmm. They were in violation of the uh, ADA. <clears throat> I remember uh, Randy Bill was defending Ford at that time from Nashville. And uh, some of the memories about the case are kind of interesting. Uh, when she got ready to testify, in, in the courthouse, the trustees, the jail trustees, slept in the courtroom at night behind the jury they had behind the jury box they had they had sleeping bags so they would clear out during the day but they anyway they were around and so i had to get her up two sets of stairs to the courtroom so she couldn't get out of her wheelchair so the two of the trustees had to pick her up and carry her up these stairs when they carry her up in the wheelchair? Yeah, or? in the wheelchair. Right. Uh, to the courtroom. And of course, the jury was sitting in the box. I made sure that we did it at the right time. And uh, that was the only way to get her up there. Uh, so I think we got about six million in that case. It was, it was appealed and affirmed on appeal. Sid, we've been going about 55 minutes so far, and this seems like a pretty good time to take a break. Why don't we just take a break for a few minutes and come okay. back and finish up? All right? Sid, you've seen the judicial system operate in a lot of places. How many states have you tried lawsuits in? Six. In your opinion, how does the Tennessee judicial system stack up in terms of the quality of the bench and the bar with the other places where you've practiced law? I'd say it's either equal or better. Now, we have adopted some of the things that some of the other states have, have utilized. I remember one. Now, uh, some of the judges are given the jury charge before argument. And I, I, I did that in Virginia several years ago. So I thought that was a good idea, and evidently they do here too. There are some places here where they do that now. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned earlier in this interview had to do with the, the collegiality that developed between you as the plaintiff's lawyer and some of the defense lawyers that you were involved with. Uh, do you find that to be a common thing here in Tennessee? I do. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Several years ago, I was getting ready to try a case in Nashville before Judge Wiseman. And Tyree Harris, Sr. and Tyree Harris the fourth, I guess, 
were on the other side. It was against the uh, CSX Railroad. So we, 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 we got there in federal court and uh, the clerk came in and said, Mr. Gilreath, uh, we don't have you on the record here as being admitted in this district. I said, well, uh, I'm sure I am because I, I've tried a case here before. I tried one with, with uh, Judge Morton. And uh, <clears throat> so Tyree said, Tyree Harris said, well, why don't you just go back there and, and sign the book and I'll sign as your sponsor. He's on the other side of the case. So we could try the case. And so that's an example of, of a real gentleman. And we tried the case and, and got a big verdict. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a good example of congeniality, you know. Over the course of your career as it has progressed, have you seen any differences in the level of collegiality between lawyers? Has that changed any as we've gone along? I think it has. I don't think it's as prevalent now as it used to be. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's probably uh, there's more lawyers than there used to be. And there's more young lawyers than there used to be. And uh, uh, there maybe have taught, been taught certain tactics that uh, you can't be friends with your enemy. But I know the bar has done a good job, though, of, of trying to educate the lawyers on that, along that line, as some of the associations have, the TBA, the uh, ABOTA, and things, you know, organizations like that have done a pretty good job. So. Uh, but I notice that as you get older, people are, seem to be more congenial towards you. <laughs> but they, when I was young, though, they did it to me when I was a young lawyer, too. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it's as congenial as it used to be, though. So in, in which professional organizations have you been most active during your career? Well, the first one was the TBA. The Tennessee Bar Association. The first convention in 1963 in Memphis. And there was a hell of a fight for president then. Jim Muneer, I believe, and Walter Armstrong maybe. It was, it was a big split, <laughs> a big fight. But it was an exciting time. And there was, no, there was no trial lawyer association then, back then, not in 63. They didn't form until 65. Okay. So then I came... Uh, I got to know Joe Henry. And Joe Henry was a country lawyer, but he was a giant. He was a he was a magnificent speaker, a magnificent advocate for his clients, and he was a great organizer. And uh, how did you get to know Joe Henry? Uh, just just by being active in in the so trial or association and in the bar association. And so he was the first president of the Tennessee Trialers Association in 65. He was president of the Tennessee Bar after that. I was so impressed by him that I wanted to be, uh, in, in that year, 67, I believe, I was uh, on the board of the Tennessee Bar Association. Because I, I liked the way I liked to see him operate, and he he was a great organizer, and he could get things done. And and he, plus he liked politics too. What and, was his uh, brand of politics? He was a fire fireball Democrat. <laughs> he was a, he was a good friend of Frank Clemens, and uh, he uh, <laughs> he used to be he used to be adjutant general of the Tennessee National Guard. And uh, one time they accused him of being drunk and driving a tank at summer camp down in Mississippi. 
Did he admit to that? I don't know, but what, later on he said, and when, when people would talk about drinking, he said, I drank up my part and quit. <laughs> so the time he was ten, president of Tennessee Bar, he, he was a teetotaler then, I remember. But uh, and he became, you know, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And so he was a, he's a great inspiration to me. Uh, so I was active in the Tennessee Trial Lawyer Association, Tennessee Bar Association, American, Bar, American Trial Lawyer Association, American Bar Association. Then I was later uh, accepted into the American College of Trial Lawyers, uh, which was an invitation only organization. And then um, International Academy of Trial Lawyers, International Society of Barristers, American Board of Trial Advocates. Those are the main ones. You were very active in the, what is now known as the Tennessee Association for Justice, were you? Yeah, not? right. And I was past president. I was, I was the fifth president. Joe Henry was the first. Tim Schaefer was the second. Charlie Terry was third. Alan High was fourth. And I was fifth. And did you maintain your activity with the Association for Justice? I did. Throughout your career? Yeah. Because as time went on, you know, when, when I first started, these, the bar associations were mostly a teaching organization. Teaching and, and helping people be a better lawyer. And they, they, they weren't involved in politics until later, they had to get involved in politics, or the, or the trial lawyers did, because there were certain laws being passed by the legislature to impede the rights of people who wanted jury trials. So uh, that, that necessitated the trial lawyers to, be, to become more in politics. And then the bar also got involved later because they were, you know, they wanted good judges and good good laws to operate under and still do. Being active in these professional associations takes up a fair amount of your time, doesn't it? Yeah. Was it worth it to you? It, it was, but, and what I did, I don't have, I don't have a boat. I don't play golf. So I just I engage in bar associations and politics. That's my <laughs> pastimes. So do you would you advise young lawyers today to be active in these bar activities? If you if you if you th if you think enough yourself to be a lawyer, then you want to be a good lawyer. And I think that's part of your development is to be involved in the bar associations because you you learn so much from other people. And that's one that's one of the best things about this profession. You never stop learning. I'm almost 80 years old. I'll be 80 next year. And I'm still learning. And, and that's the joy. I, I never did realize it was so much fun to learn. Uh, it takes a long time for some people to get it. But uh, you, you never stop learning. There's always something new to learn. And you learn it from your fellow lawyers, a lot of it. So that's the joy of being uh, being active in the bar associations. As I'm looking at this conference table right now that we sit at, it looks like you might be able to land one of your airplanes here. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large conference table and it takes me back to the story that you told about Mr. Tapp and, and how you started your law practice there at that conference table and stayed there for a couple of years. Tell us about the various changes in the form of your practice that have occurred over the, the course of your career. Uh, have you had partners over any period of time? Did you ever practice in a larger firm or has it always been pretty much Sid Gilreath? At one time, I was in a partnership. Uh, and uh, after I had uh, been practicing on my own for a while, and, be, and become active in the Knoxville Bar, a lawyer named Joe Haynes asked me to come into his office and be a partner. And that, that caused me to think about, well, you make your own breaks. Well, that, that's what happened. He, he noticed that I was doing things and that he liked, and so he asked me to come into his office. 
which I did for a couple of years. Uh, he was a divorce lawyer, and uh, he needed somebody to try personal injury cases, so it worked out good for a while. And then I decided to go back out and form my own firm again uh, in, in uh, 1971, I guess. But uh, I, since then, I've had uh, a lot of associate. I call them associates. Um, Mike Rowland and I were associates, and, and we did a lot of asbestos cases together. And then Bob Pryor came with us, and then uh, other lawyers have come and practiced with me and then left to form their own firm, which is what Mike did and what Bob did. And uh, so that's what I did. So I didn't mind them doing that. Right. And your practice now is, I see it's, it's listed as Sid Gilreath and Associates. Uh, how many lawyers are in your practice now? Five. I have a, I have a Memphis office. How'd that come about? My son is in the Memphis office, Christopher. He graduated from law school. I don't remember what year. He went to the uh, Cumberland Law School in Birmingham. He went to uh, Rhodes College in Memphis and Cumberland Law School, and then he wanted to live in Memphis, so we opened a Memphis office, and he's enjoying it. So I haven't really asked you about your personal life, but you were married for a period of time, were you not? Yeah. To? Betty Gilreath. And you are now divorced from Betty. Mm -hmm. And you have how many children? Two. Christopher is one who's now practicing law in Memphis. David is here in Knoxville. All right. And I've heard a story about Christopher going to Memphis that, that I found fascinating. Uh, would you be willing to tell us a story about how Christopher ended up actually going to Memphis? Sure. Christopher got out of law school and he came back with me here in Knoxville. We tried uh, some cases together while he was here. Matter of fact, he did a better job than I did on him. I have to admit. Uh, we tried one death case in which uh, the judge complimented him on his uh, final argument. But anyway, he, he had a child, and then he got divorced right after his child was born. And his ex-wife moved to Memphis. And uh, because she was from West Tennessee, and, and she had remarried, and he wanted to be near his son, uh, Andrew, and so he couldn't. He felt like he couldn't be a good father and be up here, and him to, and his son down there. So he decided, I'll just, I'll just move to Memphis, just so that I can be a father to my son, even though we're divorced. And he, he did that, which is something I would have probably have never done. It takes a lot of courage to do that. A lot of courage and character, too. And he, he moved down there, and he's been real close to his son, who's now 15. He's an excellent student, wants to be an architect. Uh, and uh, he's remarried since then and has another child, but, but he's real close to his son who lives with his mother in Memphis and then spends some of his time with Chris. So he moved down there just to be a good father. I detect the pride of a father in that statement. Yep. How's the grandfather business? I enjoy going down there to visit. I go, every, I go down there every Christmas and sometimes Thanksgiving and once or two or three times a year and, and uh, visit, you know, and then his children go to some of the conventions that we both go to, like we were in Montreal this summer at the convention, and he had his children with him. So we enjoyed ourselves. So now that you've achieved a tremendous level of success in your practice, you now get to choose which cases you take and which cases you don't take, as opposed to that very early practice when you took what came in the door. How do you decide? How do you decide which cases you're going to take? 
Uh, okay, what I do, one thing I do is I decide if I like my client. Because I feel like if I don't like my client, the jury may not like my client. And uh, I won't go, I won't pick up and go to places like I used to if when I had an airplane. If I would go to Dyersburg and try a case in Dyersburg, which I've done. But I don't think I would do that today unless it was a a case. And, and I would go to try cases in Bolivar, little places like that. Uh, or, uh, Little Rock or uh, Wise, Virginia, uh, Norton, Virginia. So I, I try to stay closer at home. And uh, because I, I feel like that, you know, you can only stretch yourself so far and you're, you have only so much energy. Uh, and uh, you can't uh, overdo it. So I think you said that you, you don't have your airplane anymore. When did you become a pilot to start with? And how did that come about? 1960, 65, 66, I started flying. I went up to Marstown and Evelyn Johnson taught me flying. I bought an airplane from her, a new airplane, started flying in my business. I wanted to use it to get around. Uh, and so I started flying. Then as you learn to fly, you, you get more proficient. So you get better, you get better license. You get, a, you get a, a, an instrument rated license. Then you get a multi-engine license. And so you can go in all kinds of weather. And uh, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse because you can you can sleep sleep in your own bed more if you got an airplane. You can go to Huntsville, Alabama, and take a deposition and get back in time to, for dinner. Uh, so I, I started flying a lot, and uh, and another thing that flying does it makes you a more disciplined person because you, you can't drink as much. You got to stay healthy pass your physicals uh, and be current. You got to stay current. So it leads you to a disciplined life, like you should have. You should have anyway. But some people don't have as, aren't as disciplined as they as they are should be. It's but, a little more motivation to be disciplined. That's right. So how many airplanes did you own over the course of your airplane owning career? Let's see. I, I, I started out with a Cessna 177. Then I had a uh, V-tail Bonanza. Then I had a straight-tail Bonanza. Then I had an A-36 Bonanza. Then I had a B-55 Baron. And then a P Baron, a six. Six. I hear a successful career over the course of six airplanes. <laughs> yeah. Seems like the, the, the size of your airplane and the, the expense of your airplane matched the success of your career as time moved along. It had you had to you had to pay for the pipe pay for the piper, because a, a P Baron is a is a it's a pressurized airplane. It's the it's the best one I had. It was a twin. I could fly it to Key West, nonstop, Boston, Chicago, which I did several times, lots of times. And had a good radar on it, and uh, flew it to Canada, you know. So it, it worked out good. Can you reveal for us any of the reasons you've been so successful with juries over the course of your career? I think the probably the one the number one thing would be sincerity. And, and liking people, you have to like people because you have to get along with people and uh, you have to be yourself. You can't, you can't be something else and then make people believe in what you're telling them. 
you have to uh, understand people. Um, and emphasize, emp, emp, uh, uh, empathize, with empathize people. with people, uh, and so I think that's that's it. East Tennessee is not necessarily known for the generosity of its juries, but you've been very successful. What's the key to convincing a jury in East Tennessee to fairly compensate? Uh, an injured person for damages or injuries? I, I think that uh, you got to remember one rule. It ain't about me. It's not about the lawyer. The, the client's got to have a good story. By mean, I mean, by mean story, I mean the makeup of the case is the story. And the client uh, the, the jury can, uh, they can, um, if they can believe in the client, they will try to find a way to help the client uh, if they believe in the client's story. And, you know, I, I, I know lawyers can make great speeches, and, and, and some of them are just dynamic, but it's still, it's the client's case. Uh, and how do you present your client to a jury? How do you make that jury think about the client rather than about you? How do you do that? Well, you let you let the client do most of the talking. Uh, that's one thing. And you uh, you have to craft you have to craft the case and organize the case so that the story comes out. And, and the best uh, way to communicate is with a good story. You know, you can go to, you can go to church, and here's an example, you can go to church and, uh, or, uh, and if, if, the, if the minister tells a story, you'll remember it. If he gives you a speech, you won't remember what the hell he said. So, the story is is the storytelling is is the way to do it. How did you learn to be such a good storyteller? By by, by going to seminars and learning how to do it, reading books. So. Moving to a different subject now, rumor has it that you've been pretty active in politics on a, on a local level, on a state level, and on a national level. Uh, is that rumor correct? Afraid so. <laughs> Why have you become involved in, in politics, and what have you done in the political realm? Well, my daddy said one time, he said, if the good people don't run the government, the bad people will. And I always remembered that. And then I was telling you about Joe Henry, who loved politics. And so I, I got more interested in it then, after, learn, after um, meeting him. And uh, it was just fascinating. Even when I was, even when I was in high school, uh, I was uh, interested in, and then I took political science in college. And so I was interested in how the government worked, how citizenship uh, was done, you know, and how, what made the government work, because it affected so many people's lives. And uh, to me, that was better than going to a chemistry lab and learning, you know, what, what chemicals did what, to, you know, and, and or, or an engineering lab. So that fit in with my whole basic philosophy of, of people. So politics affects everybody's life, whether they like it or not. It's going to do, it's going to affect their life. And what the people in government do affects 
everybody's life. So I figured, well, maybe, I, maybe I'd like to have a hand in it, you know. And uh, what did you do to have a hand in it? Well, I, I uh, supported candidates that I liked. I, uh, when I was president of Tennessee Associate Tennessee Trial Lawyers, I, I would go to the legislature and uh, uh, try to help our position on things at that time. And it was fascinating to watch the legislature work and to see how slow it works sometimes. Uh, but it was, uh, it was interesting and, and you got to meet a lot of different people, a lot of interesting people. I've heard that you have been a delegate at uh, national conventions. True. I was a delegate to uh, the, Cl the convention in Chicago when Clinton was nominated. I was a delegate to Los Angeles at the Democrat National Convention when Gore was nominated. And I, I, had, I knew Albert Gore as a senior also. Uh, when, I, when I first started practicing law in the 60s, early 60s, he was a U.S. Senator. And I'd met him then, and my, my father uh, liked him, and, and I'd met him. And, and so I just, that's who I associated with. So you followed in your dad's footsteps as a, as a Democrat. Yeah. And you've gone to, to conventions as a Democratic delegate. Are you still a Democrat? Yeah. So what's it like to be a Democrat in the middle of a <laughs> sea of Republicans? Well. Like you are here in East Tennessee. I have a lot of Republican friends, though, too. And I'm, I would say that I'm more uh, conservative on economic issues and more, uh, de more like a Democrat on social issues. Uh, so that would be, that might be a Dixiecrat in the old days. But, uh, but when, when, I, when I first started practicing law, the Democrats were in control of everything in, in Tennessee. The governorships, and, and it's changed now, but I, I, but I can't change just because it changed. <laughs> Do you think it's a good idea for the young lawyers who follow you to, to be active in politics as well as in professional organizations? I do. Uh, you know, it doesn't, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you, you should participate. Um, but like I said, if the good people don't run the government, the bad people will. As you look back over a career that's now spanned six different decades, can you name the developments you've seen that have had the greatest impact on the practice of law, whether that would be a positive impact or whether that would be a negative impact? What have you seen that has had the greatest impact on the, on the practice of law? Well, it began with, with the rules of discovery, okay? The, um, the technology. You know, I, I said I would never learn to do a computer. I wasn't going to be married to a computer. But did, I can't, did you keep that promise? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep that promise. It's it it it, it it's going to take over you at some point, and you. I don't carry one around with me all the time, like a lot of people. But I, you got you got to use it. You got to take. You got to keep up with technology. So that's a big change. Uh, the um, the selection uh, of uh, judges is is always an ongoing process. It seems to be changing. For the better or for the worse, in your opinion? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, there there is no. Uh, perfect way. I know a lot of people think that all judges should be elected. Well, I had a friend who who had to raise six million dollars to become a, 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 judge, a, a Supreme Court judge in Mississippi for a hundred and eighty thousand dollar job. You know, so that was a, it was a popular election. 
So the money and the politics has really become a big problem. And uh, I don't. I think we had a pretty good plan before in Missouri plan, but it wasn't wasn't perfect. But I thought it was okay. But that's changing. Right. And so of the plans that you've seen so far, including the the pure election plans, what what is known as the Missouri plan, or we like to call the Tennessee plan. It was sort of a modified Missouri plan, and now the the current plan that's in effect today. Which do you believe produces the, the, the best bench for the state? Well, at one time I was on the Judicial Selection Committee for six years. And not one time in, in all of our meetings did any of bring up whether he was a Democrat or Republican. It wasn't mentioned in any of those, me in those meetings where we had to screen the candidates. And this was during it, the days of the of the Missouri or modified Tennessee right. plan, and I, so I thought it I thought it worked very well. What other changes have you seen over the course of your career that have really impacted the practice of law? Have the, has the the cap on damages been something that, yeah. that has occurred during your practice that that has impacted you? And your clients? It, it hasn't yet, but it probably will. Uh, you know, uh, it, what I, the cap on damages is a legislative item. And uh, it's, it's brought about by the lobbyists to influence who influence the legislature. So it's a bad thing. T and the reason uh, it's a bad thing is this. The legislature who's passing a bill to say, okay, a person should never receive over X dollars in damages under any circumstances. Those same legislatures, by doing that, they don't trust juries to, to, to be reasonable. They don't trust a jury to set the, the damages in a case. So they're, they don't trust the same people that are electing them. And so it's wrong. It's just wrong uh, because juries are reasonable. You know, juries, uh, they give the death penalty to people. And, and so... Uh, and we had ways to correct a, a jury verdict if it was way out of line. Uh, and so I feel like that the insurance industry is through their lobbyists have caused the legislature to, to go off base here and, uh, and not let juries dec decide cases because the right to trial by jury is, is a fundamental right. And, and just like the right to carry weapons is a fundamental right. So if the legislature is going to support the Constitution on, on one right, then they should support the Constitution on another right instead of picking, picking and choosing. Mediation and alternative dispute resolution, good thing or bad thing? You know, I thought it was a bad thing at first, but I think probably it's, it's, it's uh, uh, it's it's a it's a good thing, because Dr. Overton used to tell us the purpose of the law is not to render justice. The purpose of the law is to settle disputes. So that's what mediation does. It, it settles disputes. And sometimes you can do things in a mediation that you can't do in a jury trial. Uh, that you're restricted on doing in a jury trial. For example? Well, for example, in a, uh, uh, a discrimination case where the, the person has been discriminated against, they want damages. Well, they, they may need something else. They may need an apology from, from the company or they may need a letter recommending them or something, which you could work out in mediations. And, and, and you, you wouldn't be able to do that in a jury, tri jury trial. So 
if you were only allowed to give a brand new lawyer just one piece of advice this afternoon, what, what piece of advice would you give a brand new lawyer? Most important one. Single, singleness of purpose is probably the, is probably the key to success having a single purpose to move on. At least that's what Napoleon Hill said. He, he, was, a, he was a salesman, but uh, uh, and I've thought about that for a long time. And, and, and because if you, have a, if you have a single purpose that you're, you, you can concentrate on and you not get, you get distracted, I think that'll keep you motivated. And of course, keeping motivated is, is the key. To, success to get up and get motivated and go do it uh, and of course I always always think sincerity is is a very key element also right. so a as we sit here today you appear to be the absolute picture of good health do you have any advice at all for those of us who want to remain as healthy as you appear to be right now? I do. I've learned some things about health the hard way. I didn't take that as seriously when I was younger as most people, most people do. They don't take their health as serious. When you're 30 years old, you think you can go out and drink and stay out all half the night, can function the next day, which you probably can. You can think on your feet, you can keep your energy level up, but you can't do that forever. And so as you get older, you have to start thinking about, well, how can I, how can I function? And I've seen lawyers that are a lot younger than me that I went to school with that are disabled, that uh, they're not healthy. And so, as a lawyer told me one time, nobody wants a sick lawyer. So you've got to, you've got to stay healthy. And I try to, and I, I, I go to a lot of effort to do that. What do you do? Okay, I have such a routine, it's unbelievable. Tell me about your routine. I take supplements. I, I take. I drink apple cider vinegar. I exercise every day. I get eight hours of sleep. I limit myself my my drinking to maybe one glass of wine at dinner. At the, uh, I. Uh, I watch. About trying, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't sit and watch a lot of television because you get caught up in, in television, you know, and, and and so you gotta, you gotta, you only have so much time in a day. You've got to, you've got to make the use of your time. And so I told somebody one time, well, you're only on this earth so long, you only have so much time. So what are you gonna do with it? So, and it helps to have a uh, purpose uh, of doing a good job or helping somebody or being professional in what you do. Provides a little motivation Keeps to you do motivated. those hard things. You've got to be motivated to do that. Now, you've got to be motivated to exercise. You know, sometimes you don't want to exercise. It's easy to say, I don't want to exercise today. So in an average week, how much do you exercise? Okay, I, I, I run a mile every morning when I get up. Then I have a treadmill in my, in my apartment, so I get on a treadmill after I get through. And I walk about 30 minutes with, extra, with the weights, uh, carrying weights. And then I will uh, do, some, do some stretching. I have a hang-up machine where you hang up upside down. Uh, How long do you hang upside down? Three minutes. 
uh, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't eat a lot of carbohydrates, uh, and I, I don't eat much red meat. Once in a while I have a steak, but not very often. And uh, so I watch, watch my diet, take probiotics. Um, so as you're as you're walking on your on your treadmill, do you, do you listen TV. to music or watch TV? Watch TV. Or read? Watch, watch the, the news. news. Watch the news. Oh. Or 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 else turn to a classic movie. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was listening carefully, and what you're saying is to stay healthy, you got to have a good diet, you got to get good rest, you got to get plenty of exercise. I, I was looking for some kind of miracle where I didn't have to work at it. Can you give me that? Mm -mm. There's no shortcut. Well, you told me the vinegar. Is the vinegar going to be a miracle for me? What does it do? Tell me about that. Uh, I had uh, uh, I have arthritis, and I've had it in my neck ever since I was in college. I think my, a chiropractor told me one time it's because you studied, bend it over, in school, reading, and, and bad posture. So I can move my neck and it clicks, you know. So the, the vinegar helps that, I think. So I, what I do, I take a tablespoon of vinegar every morning, put it in a half a glass of pomegranate juice and I drink that when I get up before I do anything else uh, before I even go running or anything and uh, so I don't know if it helps or not but your it, joints are still working yeah so you exercise pretty much every day and you get rest pretty much every day and you work pretty much every day, do you have any free time? Not much. When you do have free time, what do you do with it? On Friday night, I go out to dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you like to go out to I dinner? Because I sleep an extra hour <laughs> on Saturday morning. Any particular place you like to go to dinner? Uh, you know, there's a new little restaurant on, on Clinch Avenue called the... Um, you know where the YWCA is? Right next door. Has a great the French, chef. Yeah. French restaurant, yes. They have a great chef. They have a full menu. Uh, it used to be a, a chocolate place, but it's now a restaurant. It's new. It's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the secrets that people haven't caught on to yet. But, uh, uh, and uh, Echo, go to Echo. Out on Kingston Pike. Yeah, and then yeah. also... Uh, What's the place that used to be called Alberti's? Um, Naples. Is Naples. Now, right, the Italian restaurant. Yeah. Right. And uh, so those are three places that I go. Then, then, of course, I live downtown, so there's a lot of restaurants downtown. Um, I, I eat sushi at least one night a week, maybe two. You go to Nama downtown to eat that? I do. All right. Sid, are there some things that you haven't done yet in this in this long career of yours that you're looking forward to doing in the future? Not really. No, I think I've done what I want to do. Any retirement in your future? No. I wouldn't know what to do. I'd, I'd flunk retirement because uh, I enjoy lawyers. I enjoy being a lawyer. I enjoy being around lawyers. And... Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'd rather be around lawyers than I would doctors or other people, you know. So uh, that's the reason I stay, connect, stay connected. And Your life's about motivation, and you're not motivated to retire. No. <laughs> Is there anything else that you wish I had asked that you'd like to tell us? Well, uh, not really, because uh, I've done just about everything I've wanted to do. Uh, 
and uh, uh, my marriage didn't work out, but that's not most of my fault as opposed to hers. She was a, a good person and raised my boys when I was working. Uh, but, uh, you know, I enjoy also having young lawyers in my office, which I do now. And uh, they come and they go. They they come a while and then they want to start their own, do their own thing. I said, fine. And I've had several do that, that have been with me and then left. Uh, over the years, including Archie Carpenter, Mike Rowland, Bob Pryor, uh, and several others. Uh, You've mentioned the Pantheon of Stars. Yeah. You've been pretty lucky. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the important thing is to keep your eye on the ball of helping the people, helping your clients, and everything else will work out as long as you, as long as you protect your health and stay motivated. Uh, you know, and I've been reading a book uh, I'm, I'm Catholic now. I became Catholic about six or eight years ago. And I've been reading a book called, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, it's something about um, uh, rediscovering the Catholic faith. And one of the themes in that book is, is uh, try to be the best version of yourself associate with people that help you be the best version of yourself, work to be the best version of yourself. Uh, and that, that, that applies in any, any kind of a job or profession. Uh, so my final question to you today is, when all said and done, how would you like to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as a person who cared, cared about his fellow man, cared about the people that you've t whose lives you've touched and who's touched yours, uh, who uh, enjoyed being who he is and who he was. I think I told you, uh, I've decided that what I'm going to do, I have a place where I'm going to be buried in Kodak. So I'm going to go soon. By, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to design my own head, my own tombstone, okay? I'm have you go, got that in your mind, what it looks where, like? I, I know where I'm going to buy it. I've got a picture mm -hmm. of what it, what it looked like. Okay. So I'm going to go, go ahead and pay for it and have it set up in Kodak. Then I'm going to go up there and, and stand beside and have a picture taken of me beside my tombstone. I say, well, this, and if anybody wants to know what it is, I'll say, this is, this is my final resting place. And I'm probably going to have a, a little seat at the other, other end of the, of the grave and have a, a, a sign put on it saying, sit down and meditate for a few minutes. And I, you know, I do a meditation now. You asked me about my health. Right. I meditate 20 minutes a day. How did you learn that? I learned it on my own. I learned it on my own. I used to, I, I used to, I used to, one time I started looking at uh, transcendental med meditation. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do a, a mantra or, or say something and and uh, and I did it because I have hypertension, and I wanted to get my keep my blood pressure down. Okay, so what I do is I have a place in my office, a little office back here, or at home, where I have a a thing that I concentrate on. It's, it's a white it's a white piece of paper. That's all it is. And there's nothing around it except maybe books or, or dark. So 
I, I get I get in a chair and I concentrate on this look at this white piece of paper and if you look at it when you first start doing it it's hard to do you can't you have to concentrate to do this but if you'll do that and you concentrate and you look on it all right as you do that thoughts will start coming into your head like what am I going to be tomorrow I forgot to do this today those thoughts you, you've got to make them leave and the way you do that you go back to the piece of paper and you concentrate on the piece and those thoughts will then they'll disappear you keep concentrating on this piece of paper and soon you'll learn uh, after you do it a while that you can feel the tension all leaving your leaving your body your you got your arms where you're they're comfortable if you keep concentrating then your tension will go down and and I can I've done it so long now that I can tell when 20 minutes is up how long have you been doing I've been doing it for 10 years do you do it at a particular time yeah, of the five, day five or five thirty in the afternoon at the end of the day because there's so much, so much on your mind, and uh, I, I, I'll get upset if I don't do it. If I had to miss it, I'm, I'm, I get kind of upset. I've done it so long, and so it, it's about 20 minutes worth. Of 20 meditation. minutes, and you keep concentrating on it, and you can feel the tension going going out of your body. And I just learned it on my own because I've had hypertension all these years. And I still got it, so it helps. And learning it on your own, did you did you read a book about meditation? Yeah, but but I did. I couldn't do the transcendental meditation. And uh, I I I may have read a book about this form, but I can't remember. It's been so long ago. I've been doing it longer than ten years. I've been doing it thirty years. Wow. And I and I don't want anybody bothering me when. When I do this, I close my door. I don't. I don't have. I don't want nobody calling me or knocking on my door or anything. It's just 20 minutes. Right. And uh, you can do it on an airplane. You can do it uh, in a hotel. Uh, if I go to, you know, I'll I'll take a a eight by ten piece of paper. It's about what size I use. Like notebook paper. And I'll put it, say, on a, on a dark place on a wall or somewhere in a hotel room and, 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 and do it when I'm traveling. Fascinating. Sid, thank you. It's been an honor. I've appreciated the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. Well, I'm going to let you in on some of my secrets. <laughs> <laughs>